Hey, thanks for tuning in to this Zoom conversation. Literally, I just had this thought the other day, man, I have a lot of friends that are smarter than me in a lot of different areas. And so I wanted to just have some conversations with some different people. Uh, Jared is one of those people that is really multi-talented. There's a lot of things that he's really good at. And one of the things that I want to kind of hone in on with Jared is writing, authoring, publishing. He owns his own publishing company. He's helped me publish the book. He's uh, edited and ghostwritten and done all kinds of stuff for me uh, as a friend and a publisher. And then also just has, has had a lot of personal success with different written works, uh, lives in New Jersey. Uh, the best way that I can describe his writing style is, uh, I'm sorry, you live in Pennsylvania, don't you? I said New Jersey. Close enough. In Pennsylvania, I, right, I right can next to Jersey from my kitchen window. So you're good. Yeah. So I just basically want to have a conversation about writing, authoring, publishing. If now we're in quarantine with this COVID nineteen thing, now is the best time than ever to take something that's maybe in your heart or been in your heart for a long time, and get it out into the world. And so Jared can help. Has helped a lot of people navigate those waters. And so I just want to kind of start the conversation for some people. Uh, best way I can describe Jared's writing style. And I, I remember I read his book, creation and redemption a long time ago. And I remember thinking of like a young Donald Miller, like before he, he took like a major career turn and I won't, I won't talk about that, but this raw, authentic, very like uh, real writing style that's relatable and emotional and raw. And so uh, I would recommend, man, Jared, introduce yourself a little bit. Let, let's kick it over to you. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that book, Donald Miller. Uh, but yeah, yes, exactly. Th those two books, yes. Uh, so let me kick it over to you, man. And, and why don't you tell us, about, tell us about Jared? Tell us about how we can find you online, what you do, what you're about. And then I'll, I'll just kind of dive into some questions. Yeah, so um, I mean, Luke already did a lot of, a lot of introducing me. But uh, he and I have known each other for about 11 years now, which might make it seem like we met in elementary school, um, but we're actually, we're actually older than you might think we are. Um, we're kind of around that number 30, uh, Luke a little more so than me. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, so we met about 11 years ago uh, when we were both living in the Dallas area. And um, then Luke ended up moving out west to Abilene. I ended up moving up north, um, got married to a girl that's from here, and that's, that's kind of how I ended up staying here. And uh, my company, I started about seven years ago, uh, kind of by accident, actually, at first. I met a guy in a coffee shop, actually, the day after I had just started a corporate job. I'm sorry, we didn't meet in a coffee shop. We met on the street in Oklahoma. Um, he saw me walking around with a camera, kind of taking some photos and asked if I was a photographer. And, you know, this was back before Instagram made all of us photographers and the iPhone 10. Um, this is when Instagram was kind of first getting started. And so, um, I kind of was like, no, nah, not really. Like, I, I didn't really know how to answer that question. Like, I thought the next thing he was going to ask was for me to, like, shoot his daughter's wedding or something. And so I kind of hesitated. And I was like, no, I'm really more of a writer, but I like photography. He goes, oh, great, because I don't actually need a photographer, but I need a copywriter. Come into my office. Um, like, literally, I walk into his office and left there a few hours later with this um, – contract to do some work for him he ended up liking it so much he asked me if I would come on retainer and I'm like man I just started this new corporate job as an executive assistant um so I can't like I can't really do that and then a few months later I realized the corporate the corporate world the traditional nine to five for me it was eight to six four days a week wasn't really um my thing it wasn't really where my skill set lied and so um, I ended up calling this guy and he set me up working for him. And then he's like, hey, you need to start your own company name um, for, your, for all your other clients that you're going to get too. And I'm like, okay, what are you talking about? Um, so I, I went and kind of just picked a random company name, had a friend put together a logo for me. And... Um, my business kind of started there from accident and went from just doing some freelance copywriting to websites to helping people, uh, helping people write books. And from there, published a few books of my own. I got one of them here 
Uh, the other ones are all packed up because we just moved recently. Um, but yeah, so I have helped publish probably 12, maybe 14 books at this point. That's great. And how old are you? You're I'm 27. 27. And have been a part of that many books. That's awesome, dude. I love that. Yeah. So I, I love the thing I love about working with you is you manage to help somebody bring their vision to life, but right. retain their original voice. So mm -hmm. I felt like, like for my book, you helped me write a, a good portion of that and, and articulate better, but it didn't feel like I lost my identity in it. Mm. And so I love that. And I think you're really good at that. And so the whole point of this conversation is not just to plug your services to help people, although that could be a good benefit here. If you're watching this and you want help in this area, contact Jared. But a lot of people, I get asked this a lot uh, and I'm not necessarily the expert on it. And so I want to just kind of facilitate a conversation about, man, I have a book. I feel like God's called me to write a book or I have a book in my heart that needs to get out into the world. Where do I go from here? Sure. So I think um, the first step is, because that's, that's a conversation I hear a lot. Um, I think the first thing that I often tell people, because often people will come to me with, you know, 12 ideas. Yeah. And out of those, maybe two of them are good. Um, and a lot of times it kind of feels like the different ideas are just kind of very generic or I saw something that sold a lot of books. So I think I'm going to do something in the same vein and maybe that will go over really well. I mean, even the narrative style like of my book, like the Donald Miller um, stuff, you know, when I wrote my book in 2012, that wasn't really super popular. And now that's, that's all over the place to where, I mean, it's, it's almost like kind of become a cliche now to where even myself, I've kind of redirected and been like, okay, now we need to go do something else. Mm. Um, but the one, the one thing I will tell prospective clients and just really anybody who asked me is what's the one message that you have to communicate to the world that nobody else can. Um, sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit sassier, if like somebody tells me they want to write a book on prayer, I'll kind of smile and say, Oh, is it going to be as good as Philip Yancey's book on prayer? <laughs> or, you know, insert name of author here. Um, you know, they'll reference a very generic book and Oh, is it going to, be? and then they'll kind of, typically get where I'm going with that. It's like, Oh yeah, there's already been, you know, hundreds of books written on that topic, you know, and, and maybe you do have the next great book on that topic. But what you realize is those people like Philip Yancey, that was not the first book that they wrote. They mm. established an audience and got a voice and then, okay, I know who you are. I'm a follower. I'm a fan. So now I want to hear your thoughts on prayer. Whereas if you go out with a very generic topic, you know, it's like, as harsh as it sounds, as much noise as there is in our world today and as many options, it's like, wait, who are you? Like, why, why do I want you to talk to me about that? And so the first thing I ask people is, what's the one message that you have? And often that involves elements of your personal story, your journey. And, you know, if you're, if you're on the, the faith-based end, what God has done in your life. Um, I'm actually more in the business world nowadays. So it's, you know, w what are you doing in your business that is unique that other people aren't doing um, or that isn't getting a lot of attention? That makes sense. And I, I remember feeling that way when I was, I was 26, 27, trying to write my book. Mm -hmm. My first book, I had a goal to write a book when I was 30. I started writing it, getting it. it out there. I did it by like eight days. I did it. Um, and I remember starting and kind of feeling like, muddy the first really year or so oh, sure. because I hadn't defined that specific thing. It was just like this, I was just going to write a book and I didn't have like this, it hadn't been shaken. I had to go through some, some things and not like I went through anything really crazy traumatic, but I had to kind of discover some more messages inside of myself before I could really define what that book was going to be about. So when you Great. say that, that really helps define kind of even what I went through, like, okay, you want to write a book, big whoop. What exactly <laughs> are you going to say? Not to say, you can't write anything that hasn't been written before because you, sure. you can. Uh, and I don't think the excuse, well, I don't, I was going to write this book about this, but there's already a book about it that Rick Warren wo wrote. So I'm not going to write that. I don't right. fully buy into that either, but I, I totally get what you're saying that I think there has to be a, um, you have to establish yourself in something first before you just come out swinging with big, 
Right. That's a good, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so, okay. So I found my message. I've, I've, I've realized I'm at that point. I'm going to, I'm going to get uh, this message out there. How do I, where should I start? Like, do I, what, what steps do I need to do now? If I'm at the point where maybe I haven't written anything, but I, I have some core, I've whittled through the ideas. I've got a core message. I'm going to get out there. What do I do next? Mm. So it's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of different things you can do. You know, I know a lot of people will, you know, okay, I need to go to a writer's conference or I need to engage 10 different experts or I need to get on this blog or this thing and all it, and all that stuff is great. It can be really helpful for when you get stuck. Um, but I think the first thing, you know, obviously the first step is defining, um, your, your core message. You know, what do I really have to say that will benefit people? And actually one of the mistakes that I made with my book creation and redemption is I wrote it as more of like a Donald Miller type memoir where it was really more about me. And, and really the goal wasn't just to have a book about me because, you know, some feedback that I got, cause I, I wrote it mostly when I was 19 and published it when I was 22, I think, um, was, well, you're 19. You haven't, you haven't lived through anything. You haven't been through anything. And then when people read the book, they were like, Oh, I was wrong. Um, but the goal wasn't just to tell my story. The goal was to help people through my own story, make sense of their own. But what I realized was I didn't market that well. Um, my marketing was more on come hear my story and be helped by it rather than focusing on the end goal, the reader. And so, um, that's something, you know, if I could have gone back and do it all differently, I would, I wouldn't change anything about the book itself, but I would change the angle in which I presented, presented it, you know, the back cover copy, the, um, the, some of the marketing, some of that stuff. Um, so I think, you know, going in terms of steps, you know, is what's your message and who is your audience? You know, you're not, um, so many people, the next follow up is, well, who's your book for? Well, it's for everyone. And I used to think that way too. You know, everyone can benefit from this book. Yeah. And, you know, something that I realized along the way is, okay, if your book's for everyone, it's not really for anyone. Um, you know, one of my clients, his book is the number one book on Amazon and has been for a for a number of years, uh, we published it in 2000, gosh, 16 or 17. And I, I think it's still holding at that number one spot. In what category? In the gymnastics category. Okay. That's awesome. The book on body weight training and gymnastics. It's called Overcoming Gravity. It's 600 pages and it has a sticker price of about, um, $50. Uh, it sells on Amazon for closer to 40 and now there's a Kindle book that sells for a little bit less. But I mean, this, this client, um, I mean, basically this book and his subsequent books are his full-time job. Um, and he has a wife and a kid now. So clearly he's supporting a family on the income from this one book and other books. Um, you know, like he doesn't have a course. He doesn't have a swanky website. He, he really just has this one book. But it hit a very niche audience um and actually his first edition of it wasn't even done well it didn't have an editor um the graphics were terrible that that's actually why my company was hired was to help create the second edition now that there were, were funds to do that um that was cleaned up and stuff like that so one of the things i learned through that process was oh your book really can't be for everyone so you got to get that message straight you got to determine who your book's for and then really the next step is, you know, there's things you can do to inspire you, but the next step is just to, just to start writing. It's, you don't have to have an outline. You can, it, it helps. Um, sometimes it helps some people. It depends on your personality type. Um, What's your style? Do you start with an outline or do you just start throwing words on the page? You know, it depends on what it is. But so if you're writing for you, like just like, like let's take, for example, you're, you'd have a 21 day devotional. How well, did you, how did you do that one? You know, I don't write for me because I'm busy writing for other people. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but in the few projects you have done for Jared, how do you navigate that? Well, you know, I would say with the devotional, I had the framework of it was 21 days and I had, I think for that one, I had somewhat of an outline. I had some parameters. 
Um, some of it just kind of organically came together as we went. I would, I would say, um, actually what I'm working on now in the personal space is I have a couple novels I'm working on. Um, I don't know what that's really going to look like coming together. Um, in the future. I'm, it's really just something more that I'm working on for me when I have some spare time. Um, and so for those, I would say I have a whole storyline, the basics of it. And then the, so, you know, it's kind of like I have the outline, the shell, and then those other pieces as I go, they kind of come together. And then sometimes, you know, the project takes on a life of its own. Um, but I would say, for nonfiction, we probably would outline chapters and maybe we would have bullet points that we'd be writing from, but I don't think I've ever had, I don't think I've ever had a complete picture. And if I have thought I had one, it's always changed when we're in process because we realize it needs to be different. Yeah. I remember <clears throat> when I got started, I had an outline that I felt like I had to fulfill and it, I struggled because then I was feeling like I had to match up to this fictitious expectation I had put on my book that nobody else had but me right. versus then about halfway in, I realized, why am I doing this? Like, and I just started throwing words on the page and I realized my style was a lot easier when I would just write and then worry about where it would fit in later. Right. Um, well, you know, so, the ending, the ending of your book um, actually came from, I'm, I'm trying to remember how we did it. If it was just the final chapter, if it was a, a conclusion but the the ending from your book was actually something that i wrote for you when i was at a um a camp for college students in in upstate new york up by the canadian border i was staying in like this musty dorm and it's you know summer but it's like 50 degrees because we're practically in canada and one of the speakers who's a friend of mine was teaching this class where he mentioned this specific thing that just when he said it, it hit me that this, this principle, this scriptural thing was, this is like what Luke's talking about in this book. And I just kind of went and jotted some stuff down and used that to close out your book. And you came back and were like, oh my gosh, this perfectly summarizes everything. But I made it sound like you, even though right. it was something else. But then I, um, you, know, you know, and it's just kind of cool how the writing, you know, it's like I share the details. I'm in a musty cabin in upstate New York, you know, surrounded by big trees, you know, writing for this thing, for this guy that lives in the suburbs of Fort Worth. And it's actually totally, I don't know if I was supposed to give that away, but it's actually totally okay. believable. And it's actually something that you would say and talk about. And so that's kind of a cool part of the writing process that a lot of yeah. people and I remember that I remember having an ending for the book, but not loving it as the ending. Right. And so that summarized everything that I, it fit in with everything I had been saying up to that point. And then it kind of just locked it all together. So, right. Yeah, that was, I remember that. That was, yeah. So and you, you can't plan for that stuff. Right. You know? I didn't outline that. I didn't have that mapped no. out. Yeah. Right. No, that's good. So, okay. So we've defined our message. We're defining our audience. Who is this book for? Uh, let me backtrack to that really quick. Do you think that the reason for this this uh, this book that's the number one? Do you think one of the reasons it's number one is because it's so specific? Like, mm, I'd say that's part of it. I would say another part of it is um, just that particular author, Stephen Lowe. His his experience as he's been a gymnastics coach. Uh, he's very educated too, isn't he? Like he's super smart. Oh yeah, he like had a had his doctorate in physical therapy by the time he was he was 30 um actually well before he was 30 and I, I mean he's just my task actually was to make the book understandable for the common person so right okay I, I would regularly google different terms and then have to because he would just use words that were just like words i'd never heard of that when i googled them i'm like you know there's like three synonyms that of course i've heard of and i'm like dude like, come on. I mean, you sound smart. You know, that was one of my problems too early on. You know, I wanted my book to sound really poetic and, and all of this and everything. And, and then I really realized that, wait a minute, the book's not for me. It has to be in the language of the people. You know, there's a quote, I don't know who said it, but it says, think like a wise man, but speak in the language of the people. And I think sometimes good. we're just caught up in trying to make ourselves sound smart. And we don't think about the end user. That mm. really the best books aren't necessarily the most poetic. I mean, who, you know, some people do because it's it's Shakespeare. But I mean, 
what normal average person that has a problem that they need to solve goes, you know what, I think I'm going to read some Shakespeare. Now, they don't, you know, try to, they don't go read the King James Bible, you know, thinking, okay, let me just go find something really beautiful and elegant. It's no, let me find something that's in common language that's going to help me sort this thing out. You know, I'm already, I've already got something I'm trying to figure out because that's really what you're doing when you're writing a book. You're writing to solve someone's problem. They may not know that they have a problem, but that's, that's what you're doing. You know, like your book, you're helping people learn that, hey, you have a story, you have a message, and how do you say that? You're solving the problem of people that think their life is just boring and ordinary and they don't have a story to tell. They don't know they have that problem until you help them begin to unpack and solve that problem. That's good, man. That's a good, that's a good way of putting it. And I, I had some other thoughts. I'm going to reserve them, but uh, the, I know you love Shakespeare and King James Bible. Well, I was just, yeah, we, we probably lost a few people there. I was thinking about some um, certain presidential candidates that ran a couple years ago that like, for example, Trump and Jeb Bush were in the primaries and Jeb Bush was so much more well-spoken, very similar ideas and platform. But the, one of the reasons uh, that Trump was so well received by certain groups was because he spoke on the level of a sixth grader versus if you dissected Jeb Bush's campaign, it was targeted to like a 10th grade to senior level. And so Uh it appealed the same type of messaging, but who it was geared towards were very different. And so resonated very differently. So those were the thoughts I had. I just didn't want to make it political, but I just did. I can't remember where I read that. I read that somewhere. Okay, so we define our message. We define our audience. We start writing. Now, who do I need to start talking to? Like, how do I, let's talk about like different publishing options. Like, what are my options once I've started? Because probably I shouldn't be thinking about different publishing options and everything like too much until I've got something well written. Yeah, so I, I would say part of it determines on audience, you know, and some people go, well, I don't have an audience. You know, there's, there's ways you can build stuff from scratch. You know, what I can say there is it's either going to take a lot of time or a lot of money. Um, it's really just whatever you choose to invest there. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's anything's going to require some amount of your time, but there's certain things that you can, you know, you can, if you have the resources, you can pay people so that you don't have to figure them out. Um, but I would say the other thing, it, it really is what is your already built in audience or sphere of influence, you know? Um, I think so many people get caught up in, I want to just be in bookstores and then everybody's just going to want to buy my book. I mean, that doesn't really, the publishing world has changed so much to where, um, I mean, first of all, no, no one's going to a physical bookstore right now. Um, uh, I mean, they're closed. and even when they're open, you know, the majority of people don't wander in a bookstore just to browse and magically find your book. Um, That used to happen. And that's, you know, that still does happen when your book ends up on the bargain rack, but it gets there because it isn't selling. Um, And so really, you know, a lot of the kind of the kind of romantic idealized things we have about writing really just have to let those go. That's good. Um, because those things are often just illusions that aren't really real. And if you're chasing that, you're not going to enjoy the process, you know, that um, for me, you know, you, you almost have to think of, okay, I'm writing this book for my friends and family and anybody else who might discover it. And, you know, this isn't my, even me having a business that helps people with books, you know, books are not my primary income. Um, I have other streams of revenue that, that make up actually the bulk of my business nowadays and the helping people with their books is really just, um, the thing that I really just have always loved to do to help get a message out there. Um, so I don't think I fully answered your question. Um, I think a lot of it is just, you got, you've got to kind of let go of some of those over idealized things. Like one of them would be, um, I'm going to become an author and get rich. Yeah. And, or I'm just going to magically get this book deal that's going to make, you know, and it's, and some people do. I mean, the the reality is you, you either make a lot of money off of your book or you make next to nothing. Um, but the people that make a lot of money, it's, it's very, you know, even like you talk about Donald Miller, 
Donald Miller doesn't make most of his money off of books nowadays. He right. makes most of his money off of his marketing business. Um, so see, we're, we're similar. I, I, you know, started a marketing business just because I want to be like Donald Miller. That's good. I've always felt that you were like Donald Miller. <laughs> by accident. <laughs> I think one of the other things too, and a, a guy by the name of Bob Hamp, I went to a writer's conference right. in October uh, of 2017. Oh, that, this Bob Hamp? That Bob Hamp. Yes, that's the one. Uh, and he I said, love how much our circles overlap. And I know fun. it's crazy. So he said something along those lines of, he's like, I want you to chase your dream, but also have realistic expectations that right. you know, most, I think 99% of most authors don't sell more than a thousand copies of their book. Right. And so that gave me a good head going into it to go, I set a goal. If I sell 300 books, I'll be happy. Like I want to sell a thousand. I want to sell 10,000, but if I sell 300, sure. I'll be all right. You know, that kind of thing. So that's one of those things that was, I was over romanticizing as you put it and right. quickly realized I've got to kind of burst that bubble and go, am I writing this book to gain a massive following and to gain a lot of money? Or am I just writing this book? Cause I have a message on the inside that I have to get out. Um, right. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to kill anybody's dream. No, it, it's just helpful to get that reality check. Cause even if you hit that goal of a thousand books, you're going to sell those, maybe make, maybe, ten dollars each off of each book well congratulations you've made ten thousand dollars i don't think any of us are looking to live off an income of two ten thousand dollars a year especially then if we say oh but it took me two years to sell that many books mm, yeah i mean and, that, and that's just kind of the reality i mean you know i, I myself and my clients we have a few titles that have sold over a thousand copies and then I mean, honestly, a lot of our books, even ones you would think would sell more than a thousand copies, haven't, but they've opened up doors into other ventures that really, it fulfilled what the author wanted it to do. And that was to get a message across and, and to be able to impact people with that message. And then from there, they've been able to move into other, some of my clients have been able to move into other ventures and monetize those ventures to where you're actually making a lot more you're, you're making more of a sustainable income there mm. than you do just off the book of its own. You know, it's like one of my, one of my clients said, you know, when I kind of had this talk with him, I, ha I have this talk with basically all my clients where I just inform them that they're not going to make a lot of money unless they do. And then they're going to get really, really rich, but it's going to be one or the other. It's not really going to be in the middle. And one of my clients goes, Oh, I'm, and he, he's South African. So he has a really cool accent, but, I can't do, but he says, Oh, I'm fully aware that the book is just a giant business card. Hmm. That's a good way of putting it. It's a giant yeah. business card. So, right. wow. That's a good expect. That sounds like you're crushing people's dreams, but I know you're not. I know it's just like, it does. It almost is like another level of credibility in your life and another, right. yeah, that's a giant business card. I hate that, but I love it too. I don't yeah. know why. Well, and look too, it's, it's either crush or be crushed. You know, I, I started this very naive. I had, I had my dreams crushed with this book. Um, okay. and this book impacted a lot of people's lives, but it didn't do what I thought it was going to magically do. Right. And, so, and then I had some other clients that had their dreams crushed as well. And then it's like, oh, I notice a pattern here. I think I need to start telling people this from the beginning and set the expectation so that we can actually rejoice in what's happening mm. and not miss out on the impact that is happening just because it didn't meet up to our expectations of what it was going to look like. That's so good, man. I love that. We, we've got to set the expectations so that we rejoice in what is happening and don't be upset about what's not happening. Right. Um, I mean, you and I went through this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So do we want to talk about that or do we not want to talk about that? Uh, well, uh, no, I mean, I can talk about it. I just like, I don't know. I, one thing I want to so like, like one thing that I want to bring clarity to is kind of like, so if someone's watching this and going, yes, I have a book. I want to get it out there. Where do I, let's set some expectations. So if I'm going to self publish, how long is this going to take me from starting to finish? And then we can kind of weave in some notes from our story into this. Okay, let's do it. So how long is this going to take me from start to finish? How much time should I budget and how much finance, like how financially, what is this going to cost me? And we can kind of use my stuff as an example, or we can kind of just go for a more generic type thing. Um, well, we spent about nine months on your book, but I think you had your manuscript almost done. Yeah. 
you know, and that's where you can take as little or as much time as you want. I mean, there's all these things on the internet that are kind of like used car salesmen, you know, promising that you'll, I can teach you how to write, write a, book. a book in 90 days. And yeah, I was going to say 30 is one of the ones I've oh. seen. And you know, a lot of that stuff, I mean, I, I can't, I do this professionally and I can't even do that. Um, so, I mean, you can with, I think the devotional that I did, and I mean, it's, it's thin, it's like this thin. I think that was done in six weeks from the top, from the concept to the um, printed copies being rushed shipped to us. But there were also a lot of, you know, staying up till 4 a.m., you know, basically just living on the couch. You know, I was, I was single and had no family responsibilities. I mean, really, it was just a perfect scenario that's just completely unrealistic to the average yeah. person that I, I don't even think I could do that again. Um, so I think a more realistic is, you know, writing your manuscript, that's, that's a loaded question because that depends on a lot of different things of how long is it going to be, um, how much of the ideas do you already have fleshed out. Um, you know, I, I think the one answer I can say there with absolute certainty is it's going to take longer than you think it's going to take. Absolutely. I mean, we've even rushed projects. I've rushed projects for people because we were trying to get to one event or one thing. And then again, it was kind of like the disappointment thing. It was like, oh, we rushed this. And then this one event wasn't really the silver bullet we thought it was going to be. So I think some of the things that are important are giving yourself time and, and then just whatever you do, being consistent in it. Um, because, you know, even if you're just working on your book for an hour or two a day, if you're doing that every day, you're going to get more done than if you're spending a full day once a week. Um, even though that may look like the same number of hours, when you only have an hour or two, you're going to be a lot more focused than when you just have one day with a totally clear schedule. You're going to be yeah. on Instagram. You're going to be on Facebook you're going to get off on this whole other little tangent, you know, you're, you're, there's going to be things there that distract you and trip you up. Um, I would say the publishing process, I think it can be done in as short as six months. Once your manuscript is done, um, that's a good realistic time frame. Some things take nine months, some things 12. It depends on how much editing it needs. It depends on what different print options you want to use, you know, like, I know for your book, you wanted to go with the little higher quality print method, uh, which was great. And that took a little bit longer. That took about six weeks to mm -hmm. get them back. And then, you know, you had to buy the minimums. And that's where, you know, the stuff I was hitting on that, you know, you ended up with having the garage full of books, just like I've got the basement full of books. I have a client who has a storage room in his office called the book room. Um, you know, and so now, now more than ever, kind of the thing I'm leaning toward is just doing the print on demand where you can order one book or order 500. You can get them a little bit faster. You pay a little more per copy. The quality isn't amazing, but at least it's out there and it exists. And, and then if, okay, this does really well, we can maybe look at creating a better product and yeah. making it look a little bit nicer and maybe make it a little better quality. Um, you know, again, I used to just be really obsessed with the product. It needs to be perfect. Um, you know, I probably even had a part in, you know, convincing you that you needed the higher quality product. Well, no, I was kind of, I kind of still lean that way. And I've had this conversation. I helped a guy uh, navigate his self publishing journey and, and, uh, we had this conversation and I, I kind of was trying to steer him towards the idea of if you have the money to spend, like buy the, the higher quality print. Right. Which um, you pay less per book. You just have to order more. And yeah. And so that was, I guess one of the disappointments along my journey was that I didn't sell that many, as many as I have still in my garage, but sure. I also had set the expectation that I wasn't going to. So I knew, am I willing to just have this inventory sit around knowing right. that I have a better quality book at the end? That is true. We did have that conversation. So to me, I was willing to, even though, so Bob Hamp had already shattered my dreams of selling thousands of books. I'm just kidding. Right. Uh, but he had already kind of helped me set the expectation. And so at that point it was just a decision of, do I want to do the self published thing and, and uh, uh, print on demand rather, or right. do I want my first book to really come out strong with the quality level? And then later on, I don't know. It's, it's still, it's a conversation. Okay. I think. And your book, no doubt is a better quality product. Um, I mean, it's one of the best quality ones we've done because we invested more into it. Yeah. And, and, and that's part of the cost, you know, and it's like, I, I don't know, it, it's kind of personal expectation, personal. I think most people, I think you're right. I think I would steer most people into the idea of the print on demand world. Um, right. 
unless you've got thousands of dollars sitting around that can be put into book inventory that may or may not sell. So, right. right. Um, and you what said something else. Tell people about the process. Did yeah. Cost? Yeah. So timeline, uh, whatever it's going to take you to write the manuscript. I love some, Oh, here's what you said. The one hour here and there is more valuable than the full day. And I totally agree with that. I think that there's a myth that you have to rent a cabin in the woods in Tennessee and go right in that for a weekend. And then you'll have a finished book. <laughs> so I found, I, go ahead. Side note: I had a client that literally did that. He went to a cabin in the woods in Georgia. That wow. His in-laws own. And he did that one time and then hired me to go write his book. Because he came back and said, man, this is hard. Yeah. And I realized when I got away from all the noise, like this was just really, really hard. I thought the words were just going to flow and they didn't. And so we actually, you know, in, in his book, a lot of it is his life story. You know, it's when we say ghostwriting, it's not just me sitting around making things up or, you know, the, the only way like I was able to quote, make up the story that ended your book is because I was already in the story because I'd gone through the whole book with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but for this other client, um, we, he had an hour commute on the way home. And so we just did phone calls. We recorded a lot of them and he would just talk. I would ask him questions. A lot of it was very free form. And from that, I was able to get his life story, his leadership journey, and, and the book just kind of came together. And that, that took us about uh, 14 months wow. uh, of me working full time on the book to, to get done. You know, and that could if, be a good option for people if they've got resources and they know sure. a guy. That, I used to think poorly of ghostwriting, but I, I no longer feel that way. I just feel like it's a viable option for people to get, get a message out into the world. Sure. And, and definitely if they have the capital. I mean, we, he spent a lot of money to make that book happen. And, and then at the end of the day, he said I should have charged him double what mm. I did. Um, you know, again, it was early on in my career. I wasn't married yet didn't have as high as expenses and was still boarding, building my own portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the truest option for most people is probably something that's right in the middle. You know, that's why I kind of have a la carte packages that people can, can get where it's, you know, like, like I have one client that I, you know, I've been walking with her for about probably two years now. And I mean, I think she's paid me a grand total of $300 and, it's maybe 400 it's all for coaching sessions and but then out of that what she's getting out of that i mean that's sustained her for a couple of years i mean the book's not coming along as quick as she would like it to because she's had some other things on her life journey where there's been big portions of time where it gets derailed um but you know you can truly do that where it's a la carte and then like with yours you know you said hey i've already got the cover figured out. I mean, you're actually a graphic designer, but you even wanted somebody else to do it. And, you know, so you did that part. And so you can kind of pick and choose. Um, you know, I'm, I'm leery of these like publishing packages um, where it's just kind of a lot of fluff and stuff. And it's, you, you really don't often need all of that. It's true. And so, you know, I've kind of tried to create a business model around the fact of, and I'm really not trying to trying to promote um, as much as it's just to say you you really don't need all that stuff. And I've never wanted to sell people something that I know they don't truly need. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of people they they maybe are at a arm's distance from publishing because they feel like they have to sign this twenty thousand dollar deal uh, right. with with a, a assisted self publishing company or something like that. And it's like no, you don't necessarily need all that. And so. I think too, um, one thing, what was the other thing you said? So the, oh, the kind of just like figuring it out as you go and, and setting realistic expectations for yourself. I thought my book was going to take me 18 months to write. It took me uh, tw uh, two and a half years to write. So by the time you got it, I had been writing for two and a half years. And part of it was because I found that the slice of one hour at five thirty in the morning, I found to be more productive than renting a cabin for a weekend. Sure. Uh, because I hit a wall after a couple hours anyway. So an right. hour here, an hour there, as long as I put in five hours a week writing, I felt like I was making good progress. And so yeah, good. some people may have a good, um, some people may have a good expectation of what they're doing, but like, let me just put bookends on that. So like a timeline, I would say maybe anywhere from 18 months to three years 
uh, from zero book to published work. Uh, would you say that would be for most people that would be pretty reasonable? If you're starting at zero, yeah. Um, you know, some people come in starting at a little more than zero. And, you know, because you threw out the $20,000 number too, you know, m most of the stuff I work on is, you know, in the six to $8,000 range. You know, some stuff's a little bit cheaper. Um, you know, some stuff's 10, 15,000. Um, you know, and even those numbers seem extreme. But then when you look at the number of, the number of, stuff that's going on and, and yeah. again that's that's not even my my income is off of those deals you know I right have, i have marketing business that i that i do as well um that really is my my primary income and the book stuff is just more of what i'm passionate about um but really you know and it, it just it depends on what can you do yourself that you can yeah. really well and what can't you do yourself you know and, and how much is your time worth you know, I mean, some people can, with all the different ways you can go out there and make money now, um, you know, you can make money on, on apps. Um, I know cause I was doing it today. You know, you could, you can even go out and make part time in your free time, $8,000 and spend it on a book if that's what you really want to do. You yeah. Know, like driving for Uber or um, something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and I, I, I drive food to people. I don't drive people because the food doesn't get upset and offended and talk back to me. It's good. And it does leave weird smells in my car, but <laughs> you know, you can't have it all. My food talks back to me, but I think that's a digestive issue. Um, yeah. So, okay. Point. So let's say the average person, they're going to self-publish. They don't have any, they're not going to do anything themselves. They need help with everything around maybe $10,000. Yeah. Would, is that what I should budget if I'm going to do this thing right? I'm trying to think back to mine. I think on mine, so mine was a little tricky because what I spent, including like book inventory and, and paying for you, and, and I actually tracked my own time because I did a lot of my own marketing, graphic design, right. re recorded my own audiobook, built my I own website. I to 12 to 14, but you, you also kind of went all out. Well, I, yeah, I, I ordered like custom packaging. I, I recruited a launch team and, and ordered shirt, right. bought shirts from you actually for those. So you really I, did it right. Which, by the way, thank you for buying my unsold inventory. Yeah, man, we just shuffle stuff around. Uh, you know, we just all kind of help each other in this world. Exactly, but yeah, I think from what I tracked, I didn't pull up the number, but it was around twelve grand. Now I think yeah. like three of that I was crediting towards paying myself for if I was charging an author to launch a product and to. Uh, build a but website. You didn't really pay yourself, did you? I didn't really pay myself that three grand. I just, but the time I added up, I would have spent around three grand. So, right. Yep. Yeah. So I think the ten thousand dollar number, uh, you could do it for as little as that may scare some people. Going, oh shoot, then I'll just never write a book. Listen, you could do it for a lot less than that. It's just going to not look as good. It's the it's you get what you pay for, right? Like, right. I could do it for maybe two. It may look like my two year old cousin designed it in in clip art. Right. Right. I could do it. Right. So, well, and it depends on what your goals are. You know, are you wanting this to be a business card for your business? You know, or are you a pastor true. of a congregation? You know, um, what size is your audience? You know, and, and then when you start to look at that stuff, you, you start to go, you know, and part of it too is I, I've kind of gone to where I like throwing around the big numbers because it really helps you figure out who's serious and who's not. Yeah. You know, right. because I, I have a lot of people that just go, oh, well, never mind. I'll just go do it myself. But then what I find is a very small percentage of those people actually do it themselves. Right. And I mean, some of them do and they pull it off and it's great. And, you know, I'm, I'm truly happy for those people because it's like, you know, if you could do that on your own, then that's awesome. Um, but the reality is for most people, it just kind of the idea um, just kind of dies there. Um, which is sometimes good if the idea wasn't good. Um, but when the idea, you know, is really good, it's, it's just sad to kind of watch it get to that point because, um, I think a lot of us are more creative than we realize. And if we really want to make something happen, I mean, there's, there's ways to make that happen. You know, I don't, I don't feel sorry for the people that are, you know, asking for me to mark something down from $4,000 to a thousand dollars because they're going on a ski trip and staying at the Ritz. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Like, I've got to pay my water bill. <laughs>
That's good. And, and that's, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I went there. <laughs> I, uh, I You're think laughing. these are all real life stories. These are real things that have happened. Yes. These people's faces right now. Yeah, exactly. That's where, exactly where I was. Um, no, it's good, man. And I like what you said that, that this, the price shows you how serious you are. It's the same thing. Like if I am going to buy a piece of crap car, uh, versus am I going to drive something like what's, what's my intention for the car? Am I just going to drive it around town like Abilene where I'm not driving much more than 12 miles a day or do right. I need this car to take cross country trips? Well, I'm going to put more investment into a car that I'm going to drive across the entire state than a car sure. that I'm just going to drive in town. So and, and knowing where you want to go with it is going to help define what you want to spend. Right. And your first car doesn't need to be the souped up car. It could just be something to get you from point A to point B. I mean, True. you're not, we're not trying. I mean, I've actually sold people lower quality products than what they asked for because it's like you you don't need this for the goals that you have. That's and, true. You know, I'm I'm not going to let you give me that much money for something that you know the 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 desired result just isn't that big. You know, yeah. some some people don't have. I mean, I, I had one client that had a, a very niche book that, I mean, she had like a target audience of like a hundred people. Wow. And I mean, I think we spent maybe, she maybe spent 1500 on her book and it was really thin and um, it looked beautiful. I mean, even I, um, I mean, it's a very, very thin book. It was like 30 pages. I even apologized to her that we couldn't get the price down any lower. Um, but she had a very specific goal. It was to a very, very niche audience. Um, and she was passionate about it and wanted to do it. And so, you know, we created a beautiful product for her and it was probably the, the cheapest we'd ever created a book and, um, it fulfilled those goals. And so she was happy with the end result. Um, it really just depends on, on what your goals are and, you know, getting past the it's for everyone. And I want to, you know, be the expert in this category too. Okay. Mm. What are my actual realistic goals? You know, what, what's the smart goal, you know, to use that acronym, you can, you can Google that. Um, I think it's like specific, um, manageable, attainable. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Talking about, yeah. I, I don't know all the different, different things. I'm not smart enough to know that, <laughs> but you know, what's act, what is specific and what's yep. actually attainable. Yeah, no, that's good. And I, I think you covered a lot of that too in the beginning of knowing your audience, knowing who this is for. Your book's not for everybody. And just start writing, research different options you want to do, give yourself time. Uh, it, it sounds like it keeps coming back to the idea of setting the appropriate goals for yourself, though. And that's going to define a lot. Yeah. I think a lot of people have these pipe dreams that maybe they don't, they have an idea in their head, but they don't necessarily have it fleshed out. So that's the first step. Yeah, maybe um, you need to start a blog first off. There you go. Yeah. Man, thanks so much, bro. This has been super helpful. I hope that uh, other people find this helpful. I know that I wish I'd have had this conversation, uh, you know, four years ago before I started writing my book uh, to help kind of navigate some of that. And eventually I learned a lot of it along the way, but uh, getting started with some of this. So how can we follow you or find you online if we want to connect and, and, and pick your brain more or, or get you to work with us? Like, how do I, how do I follow, how do I connect with you? Oh gosh. Um, so I have a website that you actually did. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to, to contact me. I'm kind of like the, what's, what's the, the thing that you always use the, uh, the cobbler's kids that don't have shoes. Right. Yeah. So I'm really good at helping other people get all this stuff. I'm not really good at putting it all together for myself. Same bro. Um, more of, well, one way would be battlegroundcreative.com or just jaredstump.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. I'm sure you can drop in those links um, to where people can, can find all that stuff. Um, but really, I'm, I'm less about having a really flashy, awesome online presence and more about just creating quality products and, you know, making my clients um, – look good. So, you know, if you're just looking at my business stuff online, you know, you're just going to see like the little tip of the iceberg that doesn't really reflect what's actually, you know, happening on a day-to-day -day basis. That's good.
Yeah, no. So, okay. So cool. So man, I'll drop the info in here. People can connect with you if they want help on this or talk about it more. Thanks again, Jared, for jumping on to talk about publishing and writing and all that. I hope that if you're watching that you have found this helpful, connect with Jared if you want more questions or I can help answer some questions. Uh, and I want to see you use this time wisely to get the book that's inside of you out into the world. You can do it. Uh, yeah. So thanks again, Jared. Have a wonderful afternoon. You as well. We believe in you guys.